G'day. Welcome back to this episode 38 of, yeah, this. Now, my big goal this week is to get the jog wheel, the switches, and the e-stop working. Because once I've got those going, I also really want to make a part with the lathe, even if it's only a simple part, and I've got one in mind. My Bolly lathe has got a spindle brake. It's basically just uh, like a drum brake acting onto the onto the spindle. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. The mechanism is very simple. It's just a lever down there pulling on this push rod with this uh, pin here to this bell crank, which is, which is then the actual brake lever. As you can see, it's become disconnected. It was already slipping. I tried to tighten it up, but unfortunately, it's severed. I really don't like using too much leverage on this this because that's a cast iron arm. Now it's pretty thick, but the last thing I want to do is lever on this and have that just break off. That would really suck. I'm going to make a little puller. Basically it's just a couple of threaded rods. So let's see how well this works. Right, I think I'll just try taking this out with a um, vice grip pliers. Right, there we go. So this is the piece that failed, and this side would appear to be a pretty intact um, final break surface, I guess. That's probably where it failed when I just tightened it up just before. But on this other side, well, I guess it's hard to say. I was kind of thinking maybe it was already fatiguing because it certainly f um, slipped on me in the past. So I'm kind of thinking maybe one side of this was already severed or mostly broken, um, which was why the brake wasn't working because it would just slip. And then this was a final failure, taking out the rest of the, the surface. Either way, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to have to make another one to, to fix it. You know, I think this design's actually pretty crap. The way you've got this hole intersecting with the shoulder only leaves these two tiny areas. You know, there's therefore very little steel to actually carry the load. And the second thing is, by pulling this tight, you then lose the rotation so that the bell crank uh, forces a flex into that uh, pull rod. Now the pull rod's long and flexible enough that that's not really an issue, but I think it would make more sense to separate the two functions of the shaft and the cross drilling. So if that's our shaft with its threaded portion at the end, I think we'll make that five. What a messy drawing. Oops, I forgot to put in. Of course, I'm going to need a cut through here with a slitting saw to allow that to clamp. Last week, I wired up all the switches and that jog encoder, but I screwed it up. Yeah, the problem with my wiring was a pretty typical for me combination of not reading the manual and not understanding the manual. I was assuming I can pull plus five volts off this row, feed it through a switch and then back to the common, but yeah, that's not how it works. So it looks like what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to run five volts up to my switches, doesn't matter which, I've got a, I've got like a bus bar up there, so five volts up to the bus bar, switches back to their individual spots, and then connect ground to that common. Six and a half hours later. 
Right, well now that I've got all that wiring hopefully sorted out, let's go and have a look and see whether it's working. So we use the uh, settings page of the Gmokapai GUI. And down in the bottom corner here, there's the Hell Show. And now we can should be able to see all of our all of our pins. So, yeah, this is not looking good. It looks like the corrections I've done to the wiring are just different errors. Well, it looks like I made a a wiring mistake up at the top end of this as well. So I'm going to have to open up the cabinet again just to get in there. But I guess that's really a good thing because Nico was complaining that I never actually showed everybody what this uh, what the chute looked like. And there you can see my not so pretty solder joint. Cool, I got some mail. Oh yeah, that's it. Now long time viewers of the channel may remember that our number one fan Nico was somewhat disappointed that I used this IKEA kitchen drawer plastic stuff failed to give the right sort of machine vibe for this machine. Yeah, so luckily for Nico, Andy Pugh from the Linux CNC forum, yeah, took pity on his uh, ribbed black rubber fetish and sent me this piece of very professional looking insert rubber for my place where I dump all the tools. Well, I must say, they were right. That definitely is a much better solution for a machine tool. Big thank you very much to uh, Andy Pugh. By the way, I recommend you go and visit his website. Andy's one of the most knowledgeable guys on the Linux CNC forum. He's given me an awful lot of help with this project and with the Maho. But you really got to check out what he's done with his uh, Holbrook lathe. Some of the cool things like the um, non-round turning using the dynamics of the CNC machine with a reasonably slow turning spindle to like turn a cam in real time. He's done some really cool things with, with, with Linux CNC, so please check him out. So I've now checked my wiring diagram and redrawn it. I think I had the whole sort of common power supply here somehow tied up and maybe with some grounds and stuff. But so I've, I've started again from scratch, redrawn it, and there's a few wiring changes I need to make. So what I've done is print out a set of the wiring diagrams and I'll put them in the door of the um, control cabinets. I have also uploaded those uh, wiring diagrams to the first post of my building the mini lathe thread on Linux CNC forum. Right, let's try this again. I've set up the, uh, the hell show to show the pins I'm looking at. Obviously I've still got something not working with my with my encoder, but all the others, all the others seem to be working nicely. Well, it looks like Christmas today. One of our viewers, Gunnar, uh, didn't really think much of this little vice I've been using. It's only four inches or what's that, a hundred millimeters, uh, but it's pretty lightweight. Gunnar had an extra vice lying around which he had bought or received as part of some other purchase and he offered it to me for a good price. So there we have it. What a beast. A Linen 125 millimeter. So although these jaws are only 25 millimeters or an inch wider than my existing uh, vice, this thing is <laughs> easily four or five times the mass. So thanks very much for selling it to me and also thanks very much for how well you uh, wrapped it and posted it. And so I slept on it and then I checked the polarity of my power supply to the jog encoder and it was fine. So I've decided to connect my toy oscilloscope. And when I do that, I see it actually provides a pretty normal square wave like you'd expect from an encoder. I've checked it on both on both phase A and phase B, seemed pretty normal. So I'm guessing that the problem was just that Linux C on C's um, hell show is not able to show these, these fast transitions fast enough. Now one of the cool things about a lathe is only having two axes means uh, you don't need to multiplex a whole bunch of switches together to, to, for the selection. Nice thing about uh, the Mesa cards is they output the pin of both the high and the low value of that pin. So I can use those two separate values. You can see 
Pin 2 is currently low, which means Z is enabled. I want to flick it across for a pin high, X is enabled. I was wondering how you get the encoder count from a single encoder to divide between the two axes. But I found on a Taler 83, who's an excellent resource for this sort of stuff, I'll put a link up here in the top corner. I found on one of his videos, your encoder signal comes in, you send it through a low pass filter to clean it up, and then you output that just to both axes because only one of them's going to going to move because only one of them's going to be activated at a time. Next up, I'm testing the E stop latching circuit. So let's try it out. So we turn the machine on and E stop it. It goes off. Releasing the physical button doesn't release the software. Let's try it with the motor running. Let's do it with the jogging move, shall we? MDI. Z minus 10. Feed 10. It's moving. Stopped. Good. E-stop works. With a fair bit of help from Linux CNC Forum's resident Australian guru, Rod, I've now managed to get this working. So thanks a lot for your help, Rod. That's great. Now for such a critical part as this, you know, one of the first really usable parts off this lathe, uh, it's important to control all the variables. So I'm going to use highest quality random scrapyard mystery metal. I know it's a kind of steel, so that's as good as it gets. I'm not sure if I've shown this before, but ages ago, years ago, I made this. It's an ER32 collet chuck. Now the thread on this collet chuck is a real mongrel. I turned it on the lathe, this lathe, back when I had a belt driving the spindle directly, and I ended up being in a horrible corner between couldn't turn any faster because then the z-axis couldn't keep up to keep the, the thread pitch, couldn't turn any slower, didn't, didn't come out very well. It's probably the biggest thread I've ever done on this lathe and it was basically beyond the lathe's capacity. Yep, that one's 60 degrees. So I've created and simulated my two tool paths. I don't really have a feel for this yet, so I've told it to do 15 passes plus three spring, spring passes. Maybe too much, guess we'll find out. Okay, well, I think we're ready to go to cut my th cut the first tool path. Got all this, the tools set up. We're in high gear. Cameras are rolling. What could possibly go wrong? Hand near the, uh, near the e-stop. Okay, well, what could go wrong? It can't take a cut of a half a millimeter in high gear.
Turning the wrong way, turning too fast. Probably another corner of another insert, dead. Right, that's enough of dicking around with that. Now I've had a real guts full of it. I think I'll just finish it conventionally. Well, as you can imagine, I'm kind of disappointed about this week's efforts. I guess I need to spend more time with the machine, getting a feel for the feeds, the speeds that work with it. Things which come natural to me on the bolly, you know, you, get a, you just give a feel for what sort of depth of cut and stuff it can make. Here, I yeah, don't have that feeling yet. I'm pretty darn embarrassed by this. This is probably as bad a piece of, as I've made on my machines possibly ever. 
to add kind of insult to injury, I even managed to get both of the holes offset. You know, the, the really weird thing, it might actually work. Here you can see the actual brake shoe itself. That's also a bit misaligned, I think. Well, that's now about as tight as I want to go without stripping the thread. I mean, it's working. I guess if I stomp on it too hard, it'll probably uh, slip. Sorry to having to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next time I'll come up with something a little bit better, huh?